So we're going to talk about commons, the commons tonight. Um, so what is the commons? You probably have an image in your mind, or maybe you're looking at the image that I put in your mind, uh, of a shepherd and sheep on the hillside. Uh, that's what, what the commons was, and still is, many places in the world. Uh, the area outside of town where, you past, where everybody pastures their sheep. And uh, it's a resource. It's people that are interested in that resource because they have sheep. It's governing that resource to make sure that it lasts and doesn't get overconsumed, and uh, that the sheep have a shepherd and things like that. So that's what it is. Most of you probably have heard about the tragedy of the commons. Uh, Garrett Harding uh, wrote an article that was published in 1968 in Science Magazine, uh, where he talked about the fact that, or the fact, he. He, he, he anticipated that no commons would be able to survive because they were too vulnerable to uh, people coming in and encroaching and fencing them off and misbehaving uh, and taking more of the resource than, uh, than they were, would be allotted. That kind of argument held sway for a long time until Eleanor Ostrom came along. She's a professor at uh, University of Indiana in Bloomington. And she wrote a treatise called Governing the Commons and actually demonstrated that there are commons that have been governed successfully and are exist in existence decades and decades later and uh, even sh centuries later. There are, there are commons out there that have been operating for two or three centuries, which is pretty amazing if you think about it. Can you think of a capitalist company that's been out there for two or three centuries? I, I can't. I can't. Uh, so today we expand the commons beyond the physical commons and we include the virtual commons in it. We have free and open source software, uh, we have arts, we have culture, we have uh, scientific knowledge. Uh, all of those uh, can go into the, to, uh, the creation of a commons. <clears throat> so uh, we talk about sharing. And some people use sharing economy uh, as a moniker. Uh, but what we want to know is what is real sharing? Um, sharing, according to the, people, uh, the site called People Who Share, the sharing economy is a socioeconomic ec ecosystem built around the sharing of human, physical, and intellectual resources. That's a pretty broad definition. It includes uh, lending your neighbor a uh, lawnmower, uh, or taking an Uber to Chai Hack Night. Uh, those are pretty broad kind of uh, separation of, uh, of ideas about sharing. Uh, but what's, what's not sharing? Uh, well, I don't think Uber is real sharing. Uh, Uber is uh, a corporation that has uh, capitalized on the fact that people have cars and are willing to put, uh, to capitalize uh, a, an occupation of driving people around. Uh, we have taxis. Uh, the taxi companies own the cars. Uh, in Uber, the people own the cars. So, so they're supplying the capital. Um, they're working on a, a part-time or maybe a full-time or maybe a double-time basis uh, driving people around. But they're only getting that information through the platform that Uber has created. Um, so we order Uber. Uh, it goes out to uh, the drivers that are in the area, and uh, they come and pick us up. Uh, but they're not getting things like health insurance and uh, uh, employment benefits, because they're really gig economy kind of folks. Um, sharing can only refer to one of three occurrences. It can mean giving away something as a gift, like, here, take some of my food, or it can uh, Describe allowing somebody to uh, temporarily use something you own, like uh, here's my lawnmower, uh, or it can refer to com people having common access uh, to something that they share. Um, another thing I want to talk about is uh, the commons in relation to the uh, civic arena. Uh, in, the, in, the, in Europe, people really have an idea of a separate commons. In the US, mostly, we associate commons like libraries 
and uh, um, museums uh, with civic government. Um, there's a real case for saying that government is too big. You've probably heard that in a lot of different uh, people, and I, and I hesitate to use that term. Uh, but in a sense it is, because government is managing all these commons, and what we should be doing is the people who are stakeholders in those commons should be managing those commons. And uh, government should be protecting those as commons and, and uh, protecting them from the market encroaching on them. So uh, that's the true idea of a sharing economy. And I want to introduce Tom Llewellyn, who works at Shareable. And Shareable has been um, uh, documenting these things for, uh, since, 19, uh, since 2009. So Tom. Hello, everybody. So growing up in the United States, I had a very unique experience of being raised as a commoner. Now, not unique for many other people living around the world, as was just said. There's about 2 billion people who still in, today gain their sustenance from a commons. Typically, these are resource commons, a fishery, a forest, grazing land. But I grew up in a hybrid. I grew up in the middle of, in a village that was in the middle of, of surrounded by cities. And in that community, we paved all of our own roads. We had a series of water cooperatives that we managed all of our own water. We oftentimes provisioned electricity to each other. We even set up our own internet system when they went run high-speed internet to our community. And we had our own community governance system with a, a council of sorts where we would decide on how we would fix those roads, how we would work on those water systems, how we would spend the money that we collectively put together. And so as I, as I left my, my village, again, that was sitting in the middle of a, of a city every single day to go to school, as I got older, I, I thought about, well, why isn't the rest of the cities around us managed in the same way? Why don't people have a strong connection to, to the land that they're on, to the roads that they're driving on, like I do? And so, you know, I, I started to think about it a lot and think about that there was a lacking sense of, of feeling of autonomy and of agency in our, in civic life. And I felt like there was, there had to be a good way to be able to transition a lot of those learnings and those experiences from living in community into living in the city. And, and so I really feel like it's that sharing that, that I got to grow up with that, that many other cultures are still embracing that we're starting to lose, that really is that fabric that, that binds our communities together. And, and there's so many great examples of groups that are, that are building these things out. I'm sure many of you are involved in, in projects or, or know of projects in Chicago as well. But there's some really key ones that stand out to me as I've been looking at, into examples around the world and figuring out how they can be, they've been replicated and how they can continue to be replicated. And one of those examples is 596 acres. And this is a project that's based in New York City. And, and what happened was there was a, a group, uh, a few people living in a community, and they noticed that there was an open lot that was chained off, and they wanted to know, well, who owned that lot? Why can't we use that lot? And as they started to do some research, they found out that that lot was owned by the city. And not only was that owned by, that, by the city, but the, the city owned 596 acres of land. And so what they do, they, they went and talked to the city, they talked them into allowing them to use it, they created a community garden, and they thought, well, you know, I bet there's other people that would like to enjoy the land that's open in their communities as well. And so they started this project, and they went around and they put these, this land is your land signs up on those open lots. And they encouraged the people in the community to get in touch with them and said, hey, if you contact us, we'll help you go through the process. We won't do it for you, but we'll do it with you. And now there's over 200 community sites that have been taken back from, uh, that would have been enclosed by the city that have now been reopened to, to the city population all across New York City. These are community gardens, public pop-up parks, uh, and, and other community gathering spaces. In 2008, 2007, some of you may have lost your homes. If you didn't, there's a good chance that you know somebody who did. And in Richmond, California, there was an incredibly uh, high number of people that were losing their homes. 
And the city started thinking about it, and they thought, you know, they, they wanted to make sure that, that those that had lived in their community for so many years were not going to be displaced and kicked out of it. And so they came up with a plan that would fine any landowner who was not living in the, in the building they were living in that allowed the building to become derelict, they would fine them $1,000 a day. Now, there was very few people that were living in Richmond that were Richmond residents that weren't actually in their homes, but there were lots of banks that had foreclosed and taken away those homes that were derelict. And so this process of just putting that $1,000 a day fine stopped the foreclosures in Richmond. The city was able to use a, a clause that was based on eminent domain to completely stop that tide and keep people in their homes. Fab labs and local production. I mean, we think about so much production is leaving, so much, uh, you know, things are being, being sent overseas to be produced, and it's, but at the same time, the cost, the marginal cost of doing research and design to create new, new things is getting lower and lower. And fab labs are, are starting to come up all over the place, allowing people to do their, their prototyping and collaborate and create new products. The city of Barcelona has gone so far as to working with, the univers with a number of universities in the city. They have made sure there's a fab lab in every single district of Barcelona, and they've started a fab city project, which is now starting to go international. Community internet. So I talked a little bit earlier about how in my community, when they went and run high-speed internet, we banded together and created a system of our own, and, and it was not unique. There are many places around the world that are setting up their own high-speed internet making sure that people have access that wouldn't otherwise be able to access it. And Freifunk in Germany is one of the largest. They're in the city of Munster in the greater area. They've set up through a series of, of about 200 different responders throughout, throughout the region, making sure that everybody has access to free or, or low-cost internet. It's, uh, pay, pay what you want. There's a great examples of this in Catalonia as well, with GwifiNet and in Oakland with the people's internet. Peta Jakarta. So Jakarta is sitting in a, the, the city itself is, 40% of it is either at or below sea level. And during, every year during the monsoon season, there is massive flooding throughout the city. And at the same time, Jakarta has one of the highest concentrations of Twitter users in the world. So Twitter, the city of Jakarta, and a university all came together and created a platform that would be able to aggregate mobile data, uh, information that was coming in. And the first thing they, that they built was this, this Peta Jakarta platform that allows anybody with, uh, by, by posting messages on Twitter, to be able to create, to map out where there's flooding. It's kind of like a Waze app of sorts, but for managing city infrastructure and for letting, letting people know which roads are open and which roads are not, reducing congestion, making, you know, increasing safety as people are trying to get to where they need to go or, or need to escape where there's flooding. And, and that service, then they're starting to look at other different applications on how they build upon that. But again, it's, it's, it's working with the community to be able to uh, tell other people in the community what's safe and what's not. And in Pro Commons, we talked a little bit about the sharing economy and kind of, you know, maybe what is and what isn't. Well, the city got really interested in the sharing economy and, interested, and looked at, at a number of other cities and, and they saw what they felt was, was a number of negative effects from the kind of uh, Silicon Valley version of the sharing economy. But they saw really, really positive effects from the community scale of the sharing economy. And so what they did is they built a team of about 20 different representatives from various commons and, and sharing organizations. And working with the city, they came up with about 120 different policy recommendations that the city is now implementing one by one on how to regulate and how to enable sharing inside their communities. This is the city of Barcelona. Another way that cities have gotten involved is through the use of Creative Commons licenses. So Creative Commons license, it's like a copyright, except you get to enable use, and you get to decide how you want other people to use your, your works. Do you want somebody to be able to use it for non-commercially? Do they have to give you credit? 
can they, can they use it commercially and not give you any credit at all as you're putting it in the public domain? Well, several cities are putting their data sets, their websites, and their city code out into the public domain. Here in Chicago, there's free use of, of city information, but it's not licensed under a Creative Commons license, which means that at any point in time, they could restrict that use of that data. In Washington, D.C., where the city code is all up in the Creative Commons, because it's gone there once, now that code will always be in the Commons and cannot be taken away. In Wellington, in New Zealand, they're putting up information, their, their topography maps, information about, uh, about wind streams, and, and other kind of key environmental information that the city has gathered and is monitoring is also put up as a community asset. And, you know, as we started looking at a lot of these different examples at Cheryl, we've been, been working with groups to, to grow the, the kind of sharing movement since 2009, supporting groups to start new projects like tool libraries and time banks and community gardens and, and digital networks. We, we saw that there was a, a need to really go to that city level. And so we started working with San Francisco, looking at how the city could be really built up and open itself up as, as a platform of sorts for sharing. And as a result of, of working with San Francisco, many other cities around the world have jumped on it. The city of, of Seoul, South Korea, has made it one of their, their key policy platforms is on sharing, where now they're starting to put sharing depots inside of their new high-rise buildings. They're supporting groups to form clubs and doing all kinds of community networking and, and connection. They've enabled all sorts of new sharing initiatives to grow by offering up their 60-person design team um, and, and space and money and finances. And as a result of their, of their great success in the city of Seoul, the mayor won the, the Gothenburg Sustainable Development Award for that work. And now, many other cities around the world are jumping, jumping on board. There's about 12 in, in South Korea, 10 across Japan. Uh, sharing City in Amsterdam has been working with cities all across across Europe, and the five major cities across Sweden have all formed a group together to grow this as well. And as we've been working with both the cities and community organizers in their communities to grow sharing, we got a lot of the same questions. And really the, 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 quest, the deepest questions were, you know, we've got these problems, how are other people solving these problems, and how can we replicate that? And so we set out, we built a team of about 15 fellows from nine different countries and spent the last two years working on a new work to try and look at some of these core city sectors, housing, food, waste, water, energy, land, technology, finance, and governance, and work, and see how groups were doing it all over the world and, and specifically looking for cases that had already been replicated, many of which has been replicated not just by next nearby cities or states, but by multiple countries. And so we've pulled together 137 different case studies and city policies into a single book called Sharing Cities, Activating the Urban Commons. And so now my challenge or my, my invitation to you is one, to get the book. And I do have a couple here today, but really we've put the entire book up for free online as a PDF. We've gone even beyond that. We've published it under a Creative Commons license and we've offered up all of the design files and the pictures and everything, encouraging people to remix the book into something that's relevant for their community. And as a result, it's currently being translated into Japanese, into Portuguese, into French, and into Dutch. And so we're in, inviting everybody to use the book, to remix it, to make it something that's, that's worth for their community, and it's happening. The other thing is to keep it alive. Now, this information is only useful if people use it, if people share it. And so if you get this book, please share it with somebody else, open it up, and think about, you know, what is a project in your community? What are one of these things that can be replicated? And some of the projects in the book and some of the ideas we support are, are much bigger. You know, they take a long time to create. They take a certain amount of capital. And some things really don't at all. Some, th some projects you can start with no capital whatsoever just by coming together with your neighbors, with your communities. And that's really kind of where the commons comes, comes home. We do have these amazing commons that are still existing. We have shared streets. We have public transportation. We have our parks. We have our, our Great Lakes. We have our, our history. And, and in, those, in those places, that's, where we, that's kind of where you can, you can grow, where you can go in, 
you can utilize that history, you can utilize that existing resource, and you can build upon it. You can use that as an example to others in your community and encourage them to, to come and join with you and start some new project to add on top of what's already there. So if you're interested, you can get the book at shareable.net, and I'm happy to answer any questions and continue the dialogue as we move into the evening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the book is uh, great. Uh, so since uh, this is a very dynamic field, uh, is there something that's updated sort of uh, in real time as well, whether it's by the crowd or a central group? Sure. So shareable.net is uh, a great resource unto itself. We're a, a media platform in addition to supporting uh, cities and projects. And so we publish about five different new sharing stories at shareable.net every single week. Um, the book itself is, is currently static, but we are building a new site where it's going to be dynamic, where people are going to be able to update information and also suggest new case studies and city policies. Hi. Um, thanks for doing this. I think this is really inspiring, and I'm looking forward to reading the book. Um, I'm starting a project in Chicago that is uh, a creative reuse depot, and it's getting surplus from business, making it available to nonprofits and teachers. And I'm wondering if there's any examples that you can talk about um, that are somewhere in the world that you've um, identified, and what category would that be under? Under the categories you listed, I wasn't sure where I would put something like that. Yeah, so it would be technically in the waste chapter, although I, I kind of feel like we should have, we, we named it the waste chapter not because we actually think of these things as waste, but because there's existing waste man management frameworks and, and, and departments within cities. And so we wanted to speak to that, but really it's, it's, it's resources. And uh, the idea of a creative reuse depot is wonderful. There's a bunch of them all over the country. The, the Oakland Creative Reuse du Depot is always packed with people and wonderful things. And I used to run a summer camp and I would get all kinds of my materials from my summer camp from that Creative Reuse Depot. There's a, a, a case study or in, in the book um, that kind of touches into this as well, and it's called Warp It Reuse. Warp It Reuse is out of the UK. They've, they've recently expanded to Canada, the United States, and Australia. And what they do is they set up a, a network um, within an institution or between institutions or between institutions and the public to uh, divert waste. Uh, so let's say uh, if you go to UIC, and I was actually here uh, last year at around this time at the end of the, at the end of the school year, and walking, I always kind of like to walk around in the back ends. I, I grew up dumpster diving and 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 like to see what you know what's being wasted. And I went back behind the you know one of the one of the the management buildings, and there was huge dumpsters where they were getting rid of tables and chairs and and all this material that could have otherwise be used. So what Warp it does is they, let's say at the university, they could have posted that information to any other department. And let's say there's, a, there's an art department that has older tables and chairs. And they might say, hey, you know, we want those ones. Those ones that you're throwing out from the math department are in better shape than the ones that we have over here. And so they could claim that and bring that over to their department instead. The other, the, the other version would be that the university could post that an organization like a Creative Reuse Depot could say, hey, we want all that stuff. Come and get it that way or it could go to the public, kind of like a Craigslist. Uh, I'd, like, I'd like to hear uh, more from you about that and, uh, and listed on the map. Uh, Neural asked if we had an ongoing uh, uh, list of these projects, and we do in Chicago. We have about 480 entries in a map that we did called uh, Sharing Chicago, and we did that map right out of Chai Hack Night about two years ago. Uh, and I'm maintaining that map and, uh, and the list of the uh, data set of shareable resources in Chicago and would love to hear more about projects you have. Uh, with the example of uh, sharing internet, um, have you guys ever had any issues with like the FCC uh, coming at you guys for broadcasting, you know, high, high, whatever um, internet? There's, uh, there's open channels. The uh, particular examples he was talking about were in Germany. Uh, but in, in the U.S., the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz are open channels, and anybody can, uh, anybody can use those channels. Until recently, I had a project going here at Chai Hack Night uh, called Mesh Up the Internet, and uh, we're st sort of rethinking that. Uh, one idea was to do a pilot project uh, somewhere in the city. We're still, uh, we're still researching that. Um, there are uh, a number of places 
primarily Chicago Housing Authority. Um, there was a map done of uh, places to get free internet, uh, but nobody's actually s setting up intentionally a mesh network. Maybe this is addressed in the book, but I'm curious to hear what are some of the factors that cause some of these sharing initiatives to break down in your experience or from other people? And what are some of the things that lead, or, or maybe instead of cause, lead or you know, are, are present when these initiatives break down? So, I mean, there's, that's a huge question because you know, oftentimes there'll be an issue with founders where a founder will be really involved and then they'll get taken off to another project and disappear and then the project will collapse in their wake because they didn't democratize it enough while they were there. Uh, finances, of course, are, are, are always something. When I, I started a tool library in Asheville, North Carolina, and it took us three tries before we fully got off the ground because we kept losing our spaces uh, because someone would give us a space and they didn't tell us that they were about to sell the building. Uh, or there would be some, some other issue all of a sudden there was leaking and the landlord decided they didn't want to fix it and so we'd have to leave. So just kind of the, the infrastructure uh, issues with some of these as well. Um, you know, there's informal sharing, informal sharing. Sometimes some of the best projects are, are informal and not necessarily legal. Um, the internet ne network that we have in my community, definitely not legal. Um, and yet, it continues, and we've had it for about 10 years because we're far enough off the grid and because generally, we don't talk about it. <laughs> uh, and so that, that, uh, that keeps us going. Um, so there's, there's sometimes our issues with legality, but it's kind of just like any business or startup. Um, you know, why, why does any business collapse? Either someone changes focus, they lose, they lose funding, or it's not the best project for the right, for the right place. So one of the things that, that we do at Shareable when, when groups come to us and they want support starting some sort of a new project, one of the first things we do is we ask them to do a mapping. And so we've worked with groups in about 100 cities around the world to map out their community assets. The, one, the map here in Chicago is one of the most comprehensive maps out of all the maps in all, all the cities we've worked with. So I highly recommend that you check that out. But we, we go to the, the, the folks when they come to us, we say, do that mapping and figure out what the holes are before you start your project. Is your project the most appropriate thing for that place at that time? And has anybody tried it before? And if it didn't work before, why? And do that sort of research. And I think oftentimes we run kind of headfirst into things without stepping back and making sure that it's the right thing the right, at the right time and learning from those projects that have come before. Uh, hi. Uh, so I have something I've been thinking about a lot lately because it's kind of scary to me. And sorry if I missed where it so is sorted under. But there's a lot of really personal, sensitive information being held by private companies right now. Is there uh, this kind of sharing commons thing where that could be handled, or is there an example of that right now? Like, for instance, like a company like Facebook holds a lot of your social information, your social okay. network, uh, and they use it for explicitly commercial purposes. Right. Uh, maybe there would be a, a more, you know, nonprofit or community-based yeah. way to handle information that companies could access. Okay in a more controlled and regulated manner, but I don't know of anything like that. Well, that's, uh, that's something we're studying at Chai Hack Night. Um, there's the uh, crypto party um, and uh, a number of other uh, breakout groups that are really concerned about you know, how do we keep our data private. Uh, the fact of the matter is that commercial companies are gonna do what commercial companies do, and if you buy into Facebook, then you're buying into what, you know, uh, what Facebook offers you offers you, but then you're also paying with what they get from you, and that's, that's information. Um, one way to do that is to start our own, but that's a pretty huge, that's a pretty huge ta task, and the people that have tried that so far have not been successful, at least at the, uh, at the level that Facebook is. I, I'd say there's a couple of, of good examples of, of how this has worked, and, and there's also been some efforts that have not been successful yet. So I'll start with one that hasn't been successful yet. And that is uh, last year we, we participated with a bunch of other organizations and led a campaign to buy Twitter. I don't know if anybody saw the, the buy Twitter campaign at all, but we did a, a shareholder action where we were successful at getting it, um, at basically uh, it was up for vote at last year's shareholder meeting whether or not to explore user ownership of the platform. The platform was, was performing uh, very badly financially, and it was a really great opportunity to try and stimulate it in a new way. 
And the, the goal through, through ownership was to be able to have all the users get to create those terms of use and get to have agency in the way the company was using that data. And we were successful at, at getting it, like I said, uh, to, to a vote. We got one of the early um, venture capitalist firms that invested in Twitter to get behind us and support it. And in the end, we had nearly a billion dollars worth of ownership stake vote in support of looking into um, user ownership. It wasn't enough to, to, to have them do, do that, but it wasn't enough to get it back uh, to this year's shareholder meeting as well. So it's coming back up for vote once again. Um, but that's one way that we can, we can try to con re-control some of these larger platforms. It's really hard to start a Twitter or a Facebook, requires so much time and investment. But there is ways to try and change the, these, these institutions, these platforms, once they're there. A, a great example of, of an alternative to, let's say, Uber uh, is out of Austin, Texas. And, and a couple of years ago, the city of Austin voted to whether or not to cause drivers to have to get fingerprinted and background checked. And, Aust and, and Uber and Lyft spent $8 million to try and defeat it. It was the most money that was ever spent on a local election in the city of Austin. And in the end, they were unsuccessful. And that law passed. But, so within 20, with about 48 hours of that law passing, instead of complying with the law, both companies pulled out of Austin immediately, leaving a bunch of people who now had been used to using that service without rides. There was cabs that stopped going to various communities because it was no longer financially viable for them because people were using these platforms. All of a sudden, there was no, mobili there was no mobility service to those neighborhoods. And so out of those ashes of sorts, a number of local versions came up. One of them is Arcade City, which is built on blockchain. Another one is Ride Austin, which is featured in the book. And Ride Austin is a nonprofit uh, ride hailing app that became incredibly popular in Austin and people st began to use it and are still using it now. And it's a model that can be replicated to other cities. And ideally, much like Arcade City is built on the blockchain and is being federated, you can, you can bring your account into other cities. Hopefully the same thing will be happening with Ride Austin and you'll get Ride Chicago. Hi, um, I saw like most of the examples you gave are from cities uh, that are from develop developed countries. Is there any initiative about um, inciting cities from underdeveloped countries to implement these ideas? Sure. So uh, there's a great example, Safe Motos uh, from Kigali, and it, in the city in in Kigali there was. Um, and, and in many areas in Africa, there is uh, a huge level of mortality based on moto taxis. Uh, it's, it's one of the leading causes of death is motorcycle taxis and, and a lack of safety on these programs. And so there is a really great platform that was set up called Safe Motos, where people are able to uh, rate their, their drivers. There is a, a process the drivers have to go through to, to pass, and they have an incredible safety rate rating um, the drivers have a lot of agency in, in that business and control. And there's, there's a bunch of different examples of that happening uh, in, in cities and in countries that we would think of as being underdeveloped or, or, or developing. So for uh, units of local government who may be uh, having a rough year financially, what are some uh, low-cost things we could do to encourage this kind of stuff? So there's... A number of them, and, and a bunch are in the books. And since this is the last question, but um, you know, one example that I that I, I really like because it kind of just makes you uh, think that this stuff really isn't that hard, and and that's the walking school bus. Anybody familiar with the walking school bus before, or, know, or if this is happening in Chicago? So these are happening all over the place, and it's exactly what it sounds like. So it's a group of kids, and, and this is how I grew up walking to school as well. But um, basically, it's it's run by by the school or coordinated by the school, just like a school bus. But everybody, but all the kids walk to school. Typically, it's it's the kids are walking within about a kilometer, uh, but sometimes it's further. Sometimes it's really formalized, and sometimes it's not as formalized. But there's so many benefits to this to this type of thing. So on, on the one hand, the city saves money by not having to run the buses as much. Of course, this is a fair weather. Uh, process, but it, cr it causes less wear and tear on the buses, it reduces the, the amount of fuel, and so there's, a, there's another environmental aspect to it. But it also is beneficial to the students, they're walking to school instead of riding. 
They're getting to, to uh, meet people along the way and get to know neighbors and their other people in their community. And they're also getting a, a geospatial awareness. They're getting to know their city. They're getting to, to be able to know the pathways. And, and that's incredibly important for brain development. Uh, and they're also getting to understand a sense of place and the changing of the seasons and what that looks like when you go on that same walk to school every day and you see those trees change, you see that weather change, and, and so there's many, many benefits and it costs no money at all, it just reduces money. Thank you so much, Tom and Steve.